Aloha. Uh, my name is Sherry Broder, and I'm going to be interviewing Steve Phillips today. Uh, Steve is an author and has just published uh, this most amazing book, Brown is the New White, which I even managed to finish uh, reading and uh, have marked some of my most favorite pages. Uh, this book is about uh, the changing majority in the United States and how a progressive agenda can be moved forward. So Steve is quite a distinguished uh, attorney and social activist, and I'm very proud to be here with him today. He attended Stanford and Hastings Law School. He served on the San Francisco Board of Education, so he's had a personal background in uh, politics. He, while he was on the board, he incorporated the idea of having writers of color in the literature curriculum in San Francisco. Uh, as well as appearing with me on Think Tech Hawaii, he's been on uh, NBC, CNN, Fox News, TV One. He's written for the Huffington Post, the San Francisco Chronicle. He gave a very seminal speech at the City Club of Cleveland on some of these same ideas we'll be talking about today. And he's been very involved in the election process in the United States of America, all across the country. He's involved in the Center for Democratic Process, Progress, PowerPack.org, where uh, he worked hard to elect Barack Obama, Kamala Harris, and Cory Booker. So Steve, I wanted to ask you if you could explain, what, what does this book mean? What is this, Brown is the New White? I mean, what, what are you talking about in this book? Um, well, thanks for having me on the show, Sherry. I'm excited to be here. Um, so the point we're trying to make is that the composition of the U.S. population has changed dramatically since 1965. And uh, flowing out of the uh, civil rights movement events in Selma with the uh, uh, Selma Montgomery March, which led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act and the passage of the Immigration and Nationality Act. Since that time, the composition has changed from where the U.S. was 12 percent people of color to now it's 38 percent people of color. And so the central point we're making in this book is that people of color and progressive whites are actually now the numerical majority within the country. But to assemble that coalition, you have to build on, establish, and strengthen the participation of the voters of color. So whereas historically politics in the U.S. has really focused on white swing voters and has started from the standpoint of uh, white, uh, white swing voters, now the starting point has to be the voters of color. So that's what we mean by brown is the new white. Well, of course, here in Hawaii, we're very uh, familiar with this concept because our, the majority of our population is not white. And uh, I'm sure you know that in the 50s, after Hawaii became a state, a very progressive agenda uh, was implemented here. Uh, you know, when Obamacare passed, we didn't, uh, the state of Hawaii, we didn't want to belong to Obamacare because actually the health benefits that we offer our citizens is better. Uh, so I guess my question really is, well, what does that mean? I mean, who cares? Uh, well, wh why should we really work to change the uh, coalition and uh, increase the voting of uh, non-white citizens in the United States? Well, I think fundamentally it goes to the question of, are we going to have a democracy from a public policy standpoint? Are we going to actually have the state's priorities and resources, the country's priorities and resources, meet the needs of the majority of people? Or are we only going to have it meet the needs of a select grouping of people? In a lot of ways, this place, so healthcare is a great example, is that those who already had it, some of the uh, people on the right politically didn't want to expand health care to other people. They were fine with millions of people not actually having health care. Uh, the largest numbers of uninsured people were within the communities of color. So strengthening the participation of those groupings then led towards electing a president who actually had an interest in and a commitment to meeting the needs of the full U.S. population, which then led towards passing universal health care reform. So it's similar types of issues in that regard in terms of education, in terms of housing, in terms of economic equality, that there is a strong uh, racial gap in terms of the level of equality in our society. And if we want to create 
a democracy which meets the needs of everybody, we have to build it on and empower those who are currently disenfranchised. Well, of course, there are many white people who are in the disenfranchised group as well. There's many white people who are poor and uh, didn't have access to health care. And I believe when I look, read in your book, you had some statistics about uh, the number of people in different ethnic groups that, as a result of the passage of Obamacare, were able to uh, access health care when they had never been able to do so before. Um, so uh, could you kind of just give us a brief snapshot right. of how that looked? Right. So in terms of the raw numbers of people who have gotten health care since Obamacare passed, the majority of those are actually white. Um, but in terms of the the percentage that of a group which was uh, denied health care, Latinos had the, had, the, had the largest gap, African Americans had a large gap, so that gap has been reduced um, for those constituencies. But it is an example of how trying to address the inequalities and the discrepancies within the public policy realm do lift the boats when you have that rising tide situation for everybody. It makes things better across the board. Fighting for, economic, for educational access and educational equality improves schooling for all of the students of all of the races. So that's an important point which is not often appreciated by those who are actually fighting to address, or by those who are working to make things equal across the board, um, is that it does benefit everybody. Well, this is one of the things that I thought was so fascinating about your book, and uh, I was so intrigued by, was how you were able to use, how you were able to access and utilize statistics, how you were able to access and utilize um, data. So I just want to, this is just an example of, uh, I don't know if this is going to show up, but it's, it's a chart that you did on where Asian Americans live. And throughout the book you have these uh, maps of the country and you, you're showing all the uh, statistics that you're trying to argue from. How are you able to do that, <laughs> access all, those, all that data and put it together in such an easily understandable form? Well, I had a great team of people who were helping me and working uh, with me on this. And so um, uh, one of my friends is now a leading uh, researcher, uh, Dr. Julian Martinez Ortega, runs uh, a major a new uh, research institute in D.C., which is focused in on the new American majority. Um, another one of my colleagues and friends, Dr. Laura Laura Brady, is an expert in data analysis. So she put those different maps together. So I had some sense of what it was. I think the advantage of being able to do this was that I could draw upon people with deep data expertise, but that being more of a layperson myself, having the sensibility around what would be accessible for a more normal layperson, there's being able to read. So that partnership and combination is what enabled us to um, try to make this accessible and uh, readable. Well, I do think that's one of the things in the book that is really fantastic because the way you do it so you can visually look at the map of the United States mm. and see the different percentages of uh, people depending on what the point was that you were making. I think it's really fantastic. I wanted to ask you about the GI Bill because that was one of the things in your book that I had never, I had never heard anybody analyze that way before, but I see it as sort of part of an awakening in terms of people of color looking back at our history and being able to analyze things you know it sort of reminds me of the Woodrow Wilson school at Princeton I never I never knew until very recently that Woodrow Wilson was such a racist and I'm just so shocked to find that out and of course then I feel that they should change the name at the Princeton University, but I was just so the GI Bill, how you described how it worked for white people versus people of color. I thought it was one of those eye opening descriptions, and I wanted you to share it with our audience. Yeah, well, that was one of the big um, revelations to me in terms of doing the research and put in terms of putting the book together. When it really does, once you dig into it, starts to re uh, frame your thinking around poverty and equality and the blame that gets assigned in that regard. And so we have a profound racial wealth gap in terms of assets within the country. 
and that the average white household has about $140,000 net worth. The average black household has about a $12,000 net worth. And that's very significant. And the way that the story gets told, largely through in terms of the legacy of Reaganism and that this blaming the poor, is that people, basic, the basic viewpoint is that people have the amount of money that they deserve to have because either you worked hard or you didn't work hard. And if you're poor, that's because you're lazy, you don't have the, you're in the culture of poverty, et cetera. And so that's a very uh, ahistorical understanding. And so what I had not even fully appreciated is that basically the GI Bill after World War II was a massive multi-billion dollar government program which basically gave billions of dollars to white families to go to college, to buy homes, to get established, and to be able to create the American middle class. And a lot of the provisions of the, of the GI Bill and of the uh, federal housing uh, uh, laws at the time were actually racially discriminatory. And so you had a very racially discriminatory allocation of billions of dollars, which in fact created the American middle class. And so the notion that you know, whites have the money they have because just of their own merit and because of their own hard work is actually belied by the truth of the matter of what actually happened. But it's fascinating how little is known about the GI Bill and how few people know, um, and that's a critical part of U.S. history that we have to kind of lift up again. And then I think it can change the public appetite for measures to deal with poverty because it's not just people's own personal fault, but this, we have placed people in poverty and kept them in poverty. Well, when you say that the GI Bill uh, favored whites in terms of financial uh, assistance after World War II, I mean, of course, we appreciate our soldiers who served our country and would want to help them, but was it in the law itself that there was discrimination, or was it in the application of law that there was discriminatory impact? It was in both. So it wasn't like the law said we're only giving this money to white people, but the law said we're going to provide um, home mortgage assistance, and so people could actually buy homes. And so then you had to go get a loan. And so then for the FHA to provide a loan, then their regulations actually looked at primarily it would determine what was the uh, desirability of that neighborhood and what was its likelihood of increasing in value in the future. And though in those guidelines, those uh, regulatory guidelines, they specifically made reference to the racial composition of those different areas, which is where the whole redlining concept actually comes from. And so it was not the top level laws that were passed, but that the implementation and uh, some of the explicit implementa implementation uh, uh, guidelines were actually r racially based. Well, uh, yeah, I think in the book you give the specific example of your family, mm -hmm. uh, your grandparents' home and your parents' home. Uh, could you very briefly uh, just explain that? So uh, I talk about how my, the home that I grew up in in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, in the suburbs, is now worth about $170,000. The uh, grandparents' home, which is just a couple miles away, but in the city of Cleveland, is only worth about $37,000. Tied to that is the fact that my parents were not allowed to buy the home in Cleveland Heights that they wanted because they were black. So they had to go to a white lawyer, a white civil rights lawyer, Byron Kranz, to get him to buy the house and deed it over to them, which is how we were able to get into that neighborhood and get a house, which then appreciated in value. But we were lucky. And so most people were relegated to the areas that my grandparents lived in and trapped in homes and neighborhoods which were not appreciating in value. Okay, we're going to take a short break now, and we'll be back in a few minutes. We'll take a break to hear from our sponsors. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. Center Stage airs every Wednesday at 2 o'clock, and of course you can check out our archives on YouTube or on Think Tech Hawaii anytime you like. Why should you do that? Because this is an art show that I believe is making a difference in lives. We talk with artists of various ilk. We talk with painters and, and writers, playwrights, novelists, poets, sculptors, dancers, um, you name it, directors, uh, uh, actors, of course. And we don't on only talk about what people do, but we talk about how they do it. And my favorite part of the conversation, we talk about why they do it. And it's really common on this show to hear people say, 
wow, I didn't think about it that way. And it's very common to hear people afterwards who have seen the show say the same thing. And I hear all the time that people are inspired by the conversations that we have. So why don't you join us and be inspired too. That's Center Stage on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock. We'll see you Center Stage. Welcome back, everybody. I'm here today interviewing Steve Phillips, uh, who has just written a new book, Brown is the New White, an extremely interesting book. Uh, even uh, he has a, a, a comment from John Podesta, who is uh, heading up the Hillary Clinton campaign, saying, a must read for anyone seeking to make change happen from small towns to the halls of Congress all the way to the White House. Uh, so Steve, I wanted to kind of get into the statistics that you have in the book with relating to the different ethnic groups. And it seems to me from reading the book, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that the start, the real start of the dramatic change in America in the ethnic population was the passage in the 1960s of the Immigration Act. Uh, could you explain to us how that happened and whether or not you agree with my assessment? Yeah, well, very much so, and it's not really um, uh, controvertible that it is, in fact. So what, one of the things that you know, was uh, sobering for me to learn through the research is this, that one of the very first laws that were passed in the country was a Naturalization Act of 1790, which said that the uh, requirement to become a U.S. citizen uh, was to be a free white person. And that was the governing law of this country up until 1954, and then in practice, really until 1965, and so you actually had, and so even with the, even after even the uh, after the Civil War, the uh, uh, 13, 14, 15 amendments, they just amended that law. They didn't repeal this free white persons law, and they defeated an amendment actually to include um, uh, Chinese based on this. And there's a Supreme, Supreme Court cases from the early 1920s saying that Asians could not become citizens because they were not free white persons. And so that was the governing law. So it wasn't until 65, after Selma, after the Selma Montgomery March, all the sacrifices that went on there, that then, so first the Voting Rights Act passed when uh, Johnson introduced the Voting Rights Act and his famous speech where he says, we shall overcome. But the next day, he went and convened people and said he wants to introduce additional laws and take advantage of this momentum. And one of those was the Immigration and Naturalization Act. And so in a lot of ways, what it did is that it took down the whites only signs around the United States and allowed immigration to take place in a more natural fashion, reflective of the world's population. And that's how we've had this dramatic growth from where people of color were 12% of the population in 65 to now 38% today. Well, let's go over the different groups that have increased in population and made this difference. I think, you know, most people in Hawaii anyways, superficially looking at the United States, would think that the biggest growth was probably African Americans. But in reading your book, I see that that's really not true. Um, so could you kind of give us an idea of what's been happening since the immigration laws changed? So the largest growth has been in the Latino population. And so that, is, uh, that population is now the largest uh, minority group um, within the country, and so past African Americans in the early 2000s in terms of the full size of, the, of that population. Um, and there's approximately 54 million or so Latinos within the, within the country's population. Um, African Americans are the second largest grouping, but actually the fastest growing group by percentages are actually Asian Americans. And so that's something that people haven't fully appreciated as well. And that tends to be geographically concentrated um, in terms of the growth areas within uh, West Coast and then New York in particular. And then Hawaii obviously has a, a, a unique historical place as, frankly, the geographically proximate location to Asia. So as many Asians came over um, in this direction, Hawaii was where a lot of people stopped and stayed, and as well as being a significant place for um, where labor came in as they built up the plantations and whatnot. So that's, um, I think, some of the dynamics of how this has played itself out over the past 50 years. Well, I'm sure you know that Hawaii is the first. Brown is the new yes. one. Yes. 
And, um, you know, our majority population is very substantially not white. I mean, maybe as much as 75% or more right. is not white. Um, and interestingly, in Hawaii, our demographics have changed too. You know, for 100 years, Japanese Americans were the largest ethnic group in Hawaii, but in the last census, uh, it was determined that Filipino Americans mm -hmm. are the largest ethnic groups in Hawaii. And so what did you find about uh, Pacific Islanders in your study? Uh, yes. Were you able to uh, slice them out from Asian Americans? Well, it's interesting because it's, uh, it's uh, I open up the book talking about what's in a name and really looking at the, how different groups identify themselves and it's, uh, and it's been a evolutionary process for a lot of these different communities, right? And I talk about how, you know, my uh, grandmother used to refer to our racial group as colored, right? And so the terms like these, you know, the identity and the grouping constellations have shifted over the years. And so we're in the middle from what best I can understand and what I'm talking to different Asian American scholars um, of a period of discussion and flux around, because at one point just the phrase Asian American encompassed um, all Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And then there was more expansion to include Asian American Pacific Islander, AAPI is the term that people would use. And then now there is more of a s sense and a desire for a particular focus on Pacific Islanders as a distinct grouping, as well as Native Hawaiians as a Pacific grouping. So Native Hawaiians are actually explicitly mentioned in the, um, in the census in terms of by, by name and, and more recently. So this is all kind of in flux, and I think it's something that needs to be fully engaged with the 2020 census. And really those conversations should be starting now around which groups, how we classify, and then being able to be respectful and deferential to the particular groups who are wanting to be described in ways that are resonant with their own history and culture. So which states are moving in the direction of having a brown majority population and being able to have the privilege that Hawaii has of <laughs> of being a truly mixed society. Yeah, so California and New Mexico are both majority minority states, and so they uh, followed Hawaii's lead in that mm -hmm. direction. Um, uh, and then what's fascinating about the, where the politics of the country are taking place now, right? And so the South is seen as a very conservative area. It was the bastion, obviously, of slavery, and it's still where majority of African Americans live. But because of the demographic changes, the South is actually potentially becoming an area that could be transformed from uh, in flipping from being more conservative to being more progressive. And so you saw some of that in the 2008 election in particular, where Obama won North Carolina and Virginia, um, states that had not been won before um, by a Democrat. Um, Texas is another state that is has great potential, but it doesn't have the participation yet. But it's seen as a solidly conservative state where Republicans win races by like 600,000 to 900,000 votes, there are three million eligible non-voting people of color in Texas. And so the potential to transform the politics of that state is profound, but the investment to be able to educate, organize, and mobilize those communities has not kept pace yet. Well, I want to take the uh, example of North Carolina because in 2008, Kay Hagan was able to be elected to the U.S. Senate but she lost the election in 2014. And in Hawaii, we have a big problem with undervoting. Mm -hmm. We have like the smallest percentage of eligible voters that vote. Uh, part of the reason perhaps it is that the state is very solidly blue. But, you know, even within the context of being blue, uh, there's progressive, more progressive, uh, people and in Hawaii right now, there's an incredible amount of concern about the environment and what is happening mm -hmm. to our beautiful, wonderful, pristine, or at least formerly pristine uh, environment and perhaps overpopulation on Oahu. Uh, so I thought we could, if we looked particularly at North Carolina, and you could explain for us what happened and why Kay Hagen lost and how. It, how important it really is to not only be registered to vote, but to actually vote. Right. 
So that's a, a, a excellent example and a kind of a tragic example from the Democratic and progressive side. So Kay Hagan got elected in 2008 when Obama won nationally and when he won North Carolina. So there was a very large voter participation of progressive voters overall and African-American voters in particular. That's what enabled Hagan to go on to win. Her, because the Senate seats are six years, she was up for re-election in 2014 when Obama was not on the ticket. And so that election, there was a lower turnout in her campaign and the whole progressive infrastructure, democratic infrastructure, did not invest in increasing voters of color participation, did not try to inspire voters, those voters to actually turn out and spend most of their time trying to uh, uh, cater to the fears of the moderate white swing voters, which was a failed strategy. So the progressive side in North Carolina spent $19 million in negative attack ads against Kay Hagan's opponent. And the, ol the only rationale for that would be that you're trying to impact this narrow sector and shift how they think. What they could have done with that $19 million is hired 400 full-time staff people for an entire year. You know, those staffers doing, going door-to-door -door and making uh, phone calls to potential voters had gotten just three additional voters a week over the course of that year, Hagan would have won the election. And so that's a, an, an example looking backwards around, uh, looking back in time around how failure to invest in increasing voter turnout was had disastrous consequences. Well, that's a really fabulous uh, explanation and analysis of what happened. And I, I think it really shows what I was hoping it would, which is that how important it is for progressive people to cast their ballots and vote. Uh, you know, in the 2008 campaign, my son uh, went to North Carolina and went door to door registering people in the African American community to vote. And he was, he was so gratified because he said when he, when he first came to the door, they would be like, well, what are you, white boy? You know, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And then when they found out what he was doing, trying to help Barack Obama and help them, they were so appreciative. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, let's let's just look at okay. Well, why? Why should we? Why should we worry about all of this? And I'd like to look at a, the specific example of California, because you've said that uh, you know really getting. Uh, people of color out to vote in California has made a big difference in promoting the progressive agenda. So what are the changes that you've seen in California? What has been accomplished by uh, making the coalition between progressive white voters and progressive voters of color? So California, I think, is a great example because it, there was, it was similar to what's happening in the country now where there's a lot of anxiety and resistance and backlash originally in the early 90s. And you had and, uh, uh, anti-affirmative action policies and anti bangal education and mass incarceration policies. In the more recent period, California's moved past all of that. So we've had elections where we, on the statewide level, we've had criminal justice measures. We've actually, you know, changed some of that three strikes law so it's not as draconian as it was when it was first passed in the 90s. We have um, done significant steps in uh, criminal justice reform around uh, grand juries, right? So the part of the issue is, you know, where there's uh, shootings of unarmed people and then the decisions are made behind closed doors by grand juries. California passed the law. We're not actually doing that. Um, we're investing more money uh, into public education and through different ballot measures that were passed and there's been a very significant um, environmental measure that is uh, moving in the cap and trade resources this polluter pays law. And so you take taking five hundred million dollars from polluters, moving that into disadvantaged communities. And this was all happening in the past decade as a result of and contemporaneous with the changing demographics of the state's population. Well, I guess it's fair to say that uh, Ronald Reagan, who uh, had the anti-progressive economic policies, he was absolutely correct. Under his policies, it's trickle down, and it was drop, drop. Okay, we're going to take another uh, break now, and we'll hear from our sponsors. And we're having a really very interesting conversation with Steve Phillips, who's the author of the new book, Brown is the New White. Thank you. 
I'm Chris Leatham, and I'd like to invite you to come and watch my show every Wednesday at 3. I'm interested in a variety of issues that have to do with politics and our local business economy. And I'd like to bring on guests who like to talk about everything from technology to social media to what we can be doing to improve our environment. And so I'd like to invite you every Wednesday at 3 to stay and watch my show here with Think Tech Hawaii. And I'll see you there. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Those actually are tweets about this program. They're not. Yeah. Welcome back. I'm Sherry Broder. I'm an attorney here in Hawaii. And I have the honor today of uh, interviewing Steve Phillips, who uh, is the author of the new book, Brown is the New White, very, very interesting book about the changing demographics in, hope in the United States of America and what that means for the progressive agenda. Uh, Steve, I wanted to ask you, what, what can a country learn, what can the United States learn from what's happened here in Hawaii? Because, of course, we all know that Hawaii has the privilege of being the first Brown state, and uh, uh, we have uh, been that way really from the beginning, and that's one of the reasons why uh, when Hawaii tried to become a state, there was a lot of movement against uh, having Hawaii be a state right. because people knew it would be a brown state. Right, right. Yeah, so I think the, you know, as I talked about the original um, immigration laws in this country limited immigration to being free white persons and so that and then that followed the really you know 100 plus year decimation uh, and attacks on the native american and, and the indigenous population of the country and so the history of the united states really has been about tensions relationships between different racial groups as well as how does uh, you know, descendants of Europe relate to an indigenous po indigenous population, and then also how what is uh, on the uh, chapter that was what is justice. So you have a situation where people came to this country, took the country f by force from the people who were here, took the resources that were here, pushed out the different people who were here, but they are still descendants of those people. So what is a just public policy situation? What is the types of laws that should actually be created? How do you validate and build into the laws, the policies, the resource allocation, respect for an indig indigenous population, but also accommodate the fact that there are multiple racial groups going on? There are very few, if any, states in the country that have tried to grapple with those types of issues. So the work that I think you had done around the, California, the, the Hawaii Constitution. What do you put in a constitution that in, is in a state that has an indigenous people and yet has also had other people um, come into it? It's not even a conversation most of the country is even having. And so I think to the extent that Hawaii has grappled with these issues and thought about what these uh, challenges could be, that those, those lessons can be very beneficial to the rest of the country as we think about what should actually happen in terms of uh, justice and fairness for the indigenous population and then creating a truly pluralistic multiracial democracy. We're far behind on the mainland on those kinds of issues. Well, I don't want you to think that we've made as much progress as we uh, should have here in Hawaii. I mean, we do, we did have the creation of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, which at the time it was created uh, was Native Hawaiian voters voting for Native Hawaiians, but the U.S. Supreme Court in its uh, thinking decided that that was a vote that violated the U.S. Constitution. So now anybody can vote for Native Hawaiian trustees. And of course, ever since the creation of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, 
Uh, there's been a, there's been disputes with the state over the, the resources that should be allocated to the Hawaiian the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and of course, uh, Hawaiians feel very strongly because all the lands, or at least 98% of the lands, uh, in the in the title for the state of Hawaii were actually lands that were just taken without compensation, without right. consent from the Hawaiian people. Right, yeah, well, what's exciting though is that you grappled with the issue, right? So I actually, I had an interesting conversation with somebody who's now doing work in, the, in DC, but who's from, who's German. And she says that in Germany, that there's this collective sense of responsibility and frankly guilt and shame for the history of Germany. And then she went to the, South in the United States, so there's no sense of like guilt at all for that history of what actually has taken place there in terms of slavery and exploitation, et cetera. So, just even having the conversations uh, is far ahead of where much of the debate is in the rest of the country. Well, I mean, I certainly think that the creation of the Office of Foreign Affairs and the transfer of assets from the state to the office uh, has been a step, a very important step right. along the road, but. Um, certainly more needs to be done. Uh, and I think uh, going back to what you were just saying about uh, the lack of accountability in the South, certainly we've just been seeing that with the, uh, the Confederate flag issue. Exactly. It's kind of shocking, really, to think that right. there's still would, flag. Right. And we would even have a debate about it, right? There's yeah. like, oh yes, no, we should still have that. The fact that we had that there was 60 some amendments to design to block taking down the flag in South Carolina after the murder of these parishioners and uh, one of the state senators. And so the resistance to even relinquishing any of that control is very deep. Well, I don't want us to forget that in Hawaii, uh, during World War II, martial law was declared and mm. our own Japanese American citizens were interned at that time, and as well as a few uh, German American citizens. I wanted to ask you also, what is the Democratic Party doing wrong? I think if we look at the elections without the boost that Barack Obama was able to provide the party, uh, at the election of 2010 and the election of 2014, we see uh, really, I think it's fair to say, disastrous results for the, Repu for the Democratic Party, right. despite the expenditure of vast amount of resources. Right, right. Yeah, well, that's really why I actually wanted to write this book at this time, is because I feel a profound sense of urgency around the future of the country and the future of the progressive movement, the future of the Democratic Party, and that I, I genuinely believe that Democrats are going to lose if they do not make a priority investment and enthusiastically embrace the issues, the causes, the infrastructure of these different communities of color. In a lot of ways, people were, uh, I think, lulled into a sense of complacency by having Obama at the top of the ticket and did not appreciate the significance of his election and what he represented in terms of galvanizing and inspiring that turnout. And so without him at the top of the ticket, we face a very perilous situation that people will not be similarly motivated. And so the Democrats, and then if you look at their track record, is that there's been great ambivalence over the past eight years. And so a, a reluctance to fully embrace the agenda around health care and equality um, um, and justice. And so and continuing to cater to and uh, uh, chase after the dwindling numbers of voters who are within this white swing voter category. So Democrats need to go all in around the new American majority, popularize those issues, invest in those communities, organizations, elevate those leaders, start talking about e uh, equality issues, fight for 15, the minimum wage, comprehensive immigration reform, the Black Lives Matter movement, ending mass incarceration. That has to be central to the Democratic Party agenda. And if they don't do that, and if they don't identify and elevate leaders, including a leader to be the vice presidential nominee uh, as well from the communities of color, uh, I think they're really going to run the risk of losing in 2016. I, I thought I'd ask you about your activities in Hawaii. Um, you're the head of powerpack.org now, right? Yes. 
and uh, has powerpack.org had some connection to Hawaii? I mean, other than putting me on the board of directors. <laughs> yeah, so we have a, a PAC arm, um, PowerPAC Plus, and really the thesis being trying to identify pool resources people around the country and identify, invest in strategic um, uh, races to be able to move uh, people forward. So we did invest in Maisie Hirono's run um, for Senate. Um, in terms of really wanting to make sure that there was further diversity in the Senate and that having an Asian American woman um, in the U.S. Senate would be a significant contribution. So we were proud to be part of that effort. Um, we've also been working with and have had a, had a good uh, uh, sit talk um, um, with Tulsi Gabbard in D.C. Uh, in terms of interacting there. Um, and so, you know, we've really enjoyed being able to connect with and be part of and that you know Hawaii has a, a, a significant track record of sending leaders to the national level, um, not the least of which was our current occupant of the White House. So let's just go back for a minute to the criminal justice system. I personally think that is one of the great disgraces of the United States of America that we have more people incarcerated per capita than any other uh, so-called uh, I guess uh, economically advanced country. Uh, what what do you think the progressive agenda should be with regard to the criminal justice system? So it's it is needs to be part and parcel of uh, overall suite of investments, and so criminal justice system is tied to the educational system, the educational system's failures, and it's also tied to the economic system and the lack of access to jobs and opportunity. So all of those things need to be addressed simultaneously, as well as having a different, uh, more truly rehabilitative and redemptive uh, approach to criminal justice policies. This notion that there are just bad people who then need to be locked up and kept away from the good people belies the facts and the, of what actually happens, is that people get in situations where they make bad decisions. But that doesn't mean people cannot be rehabilitated and brought back to be constructive members of society. Some significant work has been done when Cory Booker was mayor of Newark, New Jersey, around being able to get people who are coming out of the criminal justice system on a track to jobs and responsibility and accountability. And those programs had a lower recidivism rate than the overall system as well. So it really is a question around trying to reclaim the members of that system in our as human beings who can be part of our broader society. And we also forget that these are people who are part of families and communities. And so everybody in the, who is currently incarcerated has relatives, have friends, and all those people are impacted by the, that, that level of mass incarceration that we have. So we need to be having a goal of reducing mass incarceration and increasing employment and educational opportunities. Well, we have an experiment going on in our state courts right now. It's called the Veterans Court. Mm -hmm. And they try to work with veterans who uh, get involved with the criminal justice system. And of course, a lot of veterans come back and they have post-traumatic stress syndrome or they have brain injuries. And uh, they're not really being helped the way they should. And, and the court works very closely with the VA because the services are there available. And I think that uh, that kind of a model of a more redemptive view of the criminal justice system has been very successful. If these uh, ex-soldiers are able to stay on track for a period of, I believe it's two years, then they can either have a dis deferred acceptance of guilty plea accepted and uh, the VA and the court will work to try to get their record expunged. Or they can at least uh, have their probation uh, ended. So I think that there is a lot of potential for that kind of assist, for that kind of redemptive uh, justice. I think if we look, take a quick look at uh, Texas and see how, uh, how much the death penalty is utilized there and compare that to Hawaii where we haven't had the death penalty since the 1950s, we can easily see right. what kind of difference having a uh, progressive majority can make. Uh, so, uh, what else do you think the Democratic Party needs to do to make a difference? Uh, I think one of the things that struck me in the book is your discussion about their hiring consultants, all of whom are white. 
Right. So uh, in 1984, uh, Andy Young was complaining about uh, Mondale's campaign, talking about um, the smart-ass white boys were in this. We need yeah. to have a, a leadership in the campaigns who come from these communities and understand um, what their issues are. Okay. Well, thank you. I'd like to give a big mahalo nui loa to our distinguished guest, Steve Phillips, and thank him very much for sharing his time with us. And Remind you all that if you have a chance to read this book, I think you'll find it to be quite interesting. And so, aloha, and uh, hope to see you, all of you viewers again soon.